The next project is a poorly studied area of bookbinding, the late medieval or early modern records book. We just suffered through a heat wave here, so I felt it appropriate to go from the Northern European limp-covered binding with the spine plate to a structure that was widely used in Southern Europe. All the examples I've been able to find seem to come from Spanish and Italian archives. However, I'm sure they were more widespread than this. This first video is going to focus on a mostly decorative element around lacing pattern. There is a lot of background to talk about, but as usual I'll go into this later in the video. Why I'm starting here will also be explained later. These records books were generally large and covered in vellum or parchment or leather, and to strengthen the covers they had large turn-ins in the parchment versions. I've not yet come across one which had a paste down. I'll go into the detail of making the cover in a future video, but I just wanted to show enough to demonstrate the large turn-ins. They usually had a four-edge flap that would wrap around from the back and had closures to hold the book closed. In the parchment version, the corners are usually turned in. I'll start by making a hole punching template for the eight-pointed star version. This is the simplest pattern and the most seen. In the final project, I'll add a more complex pattern and I'll do another video on this. The pattern is very simple. Cut a square piece of paper larger than the pattern. I rule in the diagonals and then fold twice. This gives eight equally spaced lines radiating out from the center. Instead of ruling the lines, you could fold the paper a third time. But this fold is never as sharp, and I end up ruling them in anyway. I cut some paper circles to decide how large I want the pattern to be. I decide to use a diameter of 72mm, which is conveniently divisible by 12. Using a compass, I draw three circles of radius 12, 24, and 36 millimeters. Where the circles intersect the radial lines is where the holes will be punched. The main source of information I have on these bindings is from Shayla Metzger's Standards of Excellence video and her accompanying notes. This is one of the best standards videos if you'd like to buy access. Towards the end of the video, she briefly does a bit of lacing on one of these round patterns. In the video she says that she's only seen these round lacing patterns on Spanish bindings. This is purely anecdotal evidence as very little research has been done on them and no surveys to my knowledge. I'm using 3mm lacing leather and I know from experience that a 2.5mm hole works very well. If I was using thin strips of parchment I could make the holes smaller. From the photos I've found and Metzger's videos, it seems the most common material used for the lace was strips of alum toward skin, which I don't have. I think this lacing leather is a suitable replacement. Now it's time to position the patterns on the cover. Most of the references to these bindings I've found are mostly informal, such as comments in a blog post about a beautiful binding someone saw, and most describe these round patterns as decorative. However, after doing a few, it's clear to me that they have a functional role of lacing the turn-ins to the inside of the cover. To serve this function, the holes need to go through the three turn-ins, the head or tail, the corner, and the foredge. This is my second mistake, and the one you'll probably spot right away, but will become clear towards the end. I measure 30mm along the corner, and then 50mm perpendicular in. I tape the template in place and punch the holes in the cover. These are very frustrating bindings to research. Without Metzger's work, I wouldn't stand a chance. These bindings were used for accounts, inventories, minutes, or a merchant's business notes. They were the 16th and 17th century merchant or official's laptop. Since they contain records, they have mostly found their way into archives rather than libraries. Archives have endless potential for the research of bookbinding, and to date, very little scholarship in this area has been done. I found some images of fantastic examples on the internet. However, they usually only have an image of the front cover, 
and the original source of the image is usually lost. Early on in my search, I decided the image at the very start of the video was the book I wanted to model. Having decided this, I've not been able to find anything else about it, nothing, including the original source of the image. The best way to lace the pattern is to do it in sections. The first is the center. I cut a length of lace longer than I think I need and point one end. I start by going out the center hole and back in any one of the holes on the first circle. I leave a short tail on the inside. Go back out through the center and the short tail will be locked in place under the loop of lace. If you want, you can glue it in place. Now go back in through a hole either side of where you went in first. You can go either direction. Then it's a matter of working your way around the center. An awl is used to keep the center hole clear to get the lace through. Metzger's notes have some diagrams if you think this will make it clearer, and there's a link in the description. Ideally, when trying to model a book, you should have lots of data, images, and written description of the book, or even better still, access to the actual book. At a minimum, for this type of book, you'd want the front and back cover, the spine, the inside covers, and some detail about the text and sewing. An image of the inside of the lacing pattern would be extremely useful. The only thing I have is the outside cover and an oblique view of the spine. But it's such a great looking book, I still want to give it a go. And this is an example of Julia Miller's modeling ambiguity. When I started studying these books, I practiced all the individual techniques until I thought I could safely go ahead and make a full binding. I felt the binding was fairly straightforward and I could skip making a prototype. But while making the cover, I soon realized that I had underestimated the size of the book. I was making mine A4 size and I thought this would be big enough, but I soon realized there was no way I was going to get three of these round lacing patterns on the four edge flap. I thought this wasn't such a bad thing as the few times I've skipped the prototype, I've wished I hadn't. Then of course, while working on this now prototype, I ran out of leather lace. And I'm still not sure what larger paper I'm going to use. I'm hoping some SRA3 cartridge paper will be large enough. I may have to find another couple of videos to fill in while I wait for the leather lace to arrive. I'll put a link in the description to where I get the kangaroo leather lace. The cover is my usual parchment stand-in, which I bought secondhand, and I still don't know what it really is. People usually describe these generically as limp vellum bindings. I had been told that vellum and parchment were interchangeable names, and I mostly used the name vellum for most of my life. Confusingly, stationary binding well into modern times was called vellum binding, even when no vellum was involved. Then a few years ago, I saw a lecture by an expert on medieval books who pointed out that the word vellum had its roots in the Latin for calf, just like veal does. After this, I started using parchment as the generic term for stretched animal skin and try and reserve vellum for calf parchment. To finish, you just cut off the lace and glue it down. Or, like I do, you can tuck it under the other lace to hold it in place. I do apply some glue. The inside of the lacing pattern is exposed, so you do want to keep it as neat as possible. Between the first and second circles is laced in two parts. First you go around the circle in one direction, then the other, resulting in diagonals that cross each other. Go out through any hole in the second circle and back in a hole either side on the first circle to make a diagonal. Go back out the hole on the second circle on the same radial that you went in on. Continue this around until you complete the circle. Finish by tying the tails of the lace together with a simple twist knot and a bit of glue to make sure it doesn't come undone. 
As usual, it's hard to describe, but this is why I make videos. And don't forget Metzger's notes. I'll save talking about sewing these books for a more appropriate video. It does seem common for the book block to be sewn on leather thongs and the cover made like a case and the two to be joined using secondary tackets. But it also seems common for the choirs or sections to be attached to the cover using primary tackets. The glib description of a tacket is that it's a medieval staple. It's a loop of parchment that goes through two closely spaced holes and twisted together. For something so simple, there's a dizzying number of variations. Again, a topic for the future. One of the main reasons I was determined to model the book in the photo at the start of the video is that I believe the sections are sewn into the cover using a variation of long stitch called archival long stitch, which doesn't use link stitches, rather simple spans between the sections. From this photo, it's not possible to tell which variation of archival link stitch it is, or to be absolutely sure it is archival link stitch. But I will make an educated guess sometime in the future. Going around the circle the second time is the same as the first, except in the opposite direction, and it's a bit harder to push the lace through the holes because they're starting to get crowded. There's no hard rule that you must use separate pieces of lace for each of these sections. Once you've gone around one way, you could use the same piece of lace and keep going in the other direction, and maybe just glue the starting tail down. But using long pieces of lace, it's easy to get time-consuming twists, and I find it easier and neater to do it in these sections.
The lacing between the second and outside circle is the same as between the first and the second. As I've mentioned, this is the most common and easiest circular lacing pattern. There are a number of other common patterns, and the two outer ones in the photo at the beginning are an example. It's easy to vary the look of the pattern by changing the spacing between the circles. They don't have to be equally spaced. And they don't have to be eight-pointed stars. Again, in the photo at the start, the outer pattern starts with a six-pointed star and swaps to 12-pointed for the outer circle. And there are zigzags in between instead of a crossing pattern. The lacing leather was also coloured. I think in the photos you can see that maybe some of the lace was pink and some was brown. In Metzger's video she uses these colours and I'll probably use them in the future too. So I'm sure you've noticed the mistake I made. The initial positions I put the patterns didn't lace down the 4-edge turn-ins. I realised this early enough to adjust, but for some reason I didn't erase both the initial marks, and I ended up positioning one of the patterns in the wrong spot, thus missing the 4-edge turn-in. This turn-in will still be laced down when the leather toggles for the closures are added, so it wouldn't have been the end of the world, just annoying. While on a records binding, this lacing pattern usually also serves a functional purpose, there is no reason it can't be used purely as a decorative element, and it could be used on any modern binding. I hope you come up with some imaginative ways to use it in your own work. It may be a couple of weeks before I get back to this binding, but it will happen. As always, I really appreciate you hitting the like button, 
You can support the making of more videos like this through Patreon. If you want to be notified of my future videos, please hit the subscribe button and ring the bell. Until next time, cheerio.